several of our webinars previously. Um, you know, we hope that these lunch and learn sessions will be a way to connect our community during this very difficult time. Um, you know, if you're not a member of IEC, there's some information uh, that Tucker's putting in the chat box about how you can sign up and join, um, how you can, you know, support our organization in, in many ways. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about coal ash and what that is and the impacts to Illinois' groundwater. Um, for those of you that are uh, here to get CLE credits, um, I'm going to put a link in the chat box that you'll be able to, you'll have to copy paste um, and it should take you to a Google Doc where you can fill out your information to get CLE credits for today's webinar. Um, I'll also add my email in case you're having trouble um, and you can send me a note and I will send you this link directly. Uh, there we go. Let me just make sure we got everyone in there. Okay, um, and if you did join by Zoom and have participated in these before, you should be able to um, understand that you can ask any questions during this time in the chat box. We'll do Q&A at the end. Um, you can also raise your hand when we get to Q&A. If you're on the phone, you can hit star nine um, to raise your hand. Uh, and when we get to Q&A again, star six will be to, to unmute. Um, and with that, I, I definitely want to thank Faith Bugel, who is with the Sierra Club, um, for being our presenter today to talk about coal ash. Um, and I'll let Faith give a little bit of background and then just, just jump in into this conversation. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us um, today. Uh Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see some familiar names here. Um, uh, my name is Faith Bugle, as Colleen said. A uh, little bit about my background. I am an attorney, and I, my, most of my career has been spent doing work on coal in Illinois, also other states, Kentucky, Michigan, um, initially, I started out as an air attorney doing mostly Clean Air Act, um, but as you know, the times have changed and as needs have shifted, I have been doing much more groundwater work recently related to coal ash um, in Illinois. I started my career at Environmental Law and Policy Center. I was there for about 14 years. And for the past five to six years, I have been, um, I am a solo practitioner, but I do have a contract with Sierra Club. I'm on retainer with Sierra Club and they pick up my whole contract for all my work. Um, recently, I have handled uh, a couple rulemakings and a few cases before the Pollution Control Board. Um, my coal ash work probably started with the first Illinois coal ash rulemaking back in about 2014, which was before the Illinois Pollution Control Board. Uh, but with the federal coal ash rule coming along, the Illinois Pollution Control Board stayed and I think ultimately dismissed that rulemaking just recently. Um, and now we have, we obviously have the federal coal ash rule uh, as it is evolving as we speak. I know there are hearings this week and next week. And then we have a new Illinois coal ash rule as well. Um, in between, what happened was we had before the pollution board, uh, Sierra Club versus Midwest Gen, uh, Sierra Club versus CWLP, and Sierra Club versus Dynegy is now there as well. Um, I'm going to focus on the first two of those cases because there have been some decisions in those cases that are um, pretty, some watershed decisions, uh, no pun intended. Um, but I want to start by saying, just giving a little bit of background about coal ash and how it's been handled, what it is. Um, first, it, this does come from coal-fired power plants. 
when they burn coal and you have the ash, which is left over at the end of the process. There are several different types of ash, including fly ash and bottom ash and also boiler slag. Frequently, bottom ash and boiler slag get lumped together. And my understanding is that boiler slag might be a little bit bigger than bottom ash. Um, but uh, just the distinction between fly ash and bottom ash, fly ash is what's coming up the stack. It's much lighter, papery thin, and it gets trapped either by an ESP or a, um, a bag house and tends to stay dry. Um, bottom ash is what is left at the bottom of the boiler at the end of the process. And uh, that has historically, it's been handled several different ways. Um, really historically, maybe 50 plus years ago, uh, we did have it landfilled a lot in Illinois um, in unlined landfills, also in, in mostly in unlined landfills. And these can be very, very deep landfills. The ones that we have seen at Midwest Gen are deep enough that they would, the bottom of the landfill would be above the top of the water table. Um, so after, after that practice was discontinued of putting it in landfills, what we had was sluicing of ash. And sluicing means basically moving it around with water. Uh, and that's when we started seeing coal ash ponds used more than landfills. Um, and these might have been unlined ponds. In some cases, they are lined with something, again, pointing to the Midwest Gen example, they can be lined with something called Pazopac, which is like a mixture that uses ash and cement. And what we saw there is that it didn't hold up over time. Um, it could crack and degrade. Uh, so, but because the ash was being moved around with water, it did need to be put in ponds. Um, most recently, what we've seen is dry ash handling, which from a contamination perspective is better than a pond. Uh, simply because the ash is not wet, so it can't leach. Um, but not, I'm not going to spend too much time on dry ash handling because that has not been at issue in the couple of cases that I mentioned. Uh, so I want to start by talking about Sierra Club versus Midwest Generation. Quick history of that case is that it started, we started that case in 2012. Uh, it was not limited to just Sierra Club, but it was Sierra Club Environmental Law and Policy Center as part of it, Prairie Rivers Network, um, it, and the Citizens Against Ruining the Environment Care out in Will County, and also um, the Environmental Integrity Project. Uh, so lots of groups on it. Started in 2012, it was stalled right away by Midwest Generations um, bankruptcy uh, filing, which stops all, there's the bankruptcy court stay ongoing litigation when there's a bankruptcy filing. And it took about two years, if I'm remembering correctly, to get the case going again. Uh, the stay at one point was lifted, uh, but then there was other motions for stay. So basically that case has been going on eight years. Uh, most recently in that case, uh, well, just quick history, there was a motion to dismiss. I'm going to talk about that decision, a motion to stay a motion and then there was a decision there was summary judgment motions um, but then it got the case was bifurcated into liability phase and remedy phase we did get a decision on the liability phase uh, where the a big win for the environmental groups 
and there was a motion to, for reconsideration, which was decided in February of 2020. And now we are at remedy phase, uh, which is just getting going right now. Uh, so really the decisions are gonna be made on what the remedy should be for the violations that the, uh, that the board found. Um, but I want to go back to all the way to the motion to, to dismiss, which was back, a decision was made on that back in October 3rd of 2013. And there were a couple important points um, from that decision. Uh, first of all, um, the, there were existing IEPA violation notices when that case was filed. So the first thing that the board was considering was the effect of IEPA pursuing enforcement. Um, and then ultimately the IEPA entered compliance commitment agreements with the company regarding how they would resolve the violation notices that were before the IEPA. Um, generally, those compliance commitment agreements involved relining several ponds um, although not all the ponds, and one interesting one to point to is Waukegan, there was a compliance commitment agreement even though none of the ponds got relined. Um, and then there was groundwater monitoring, ongoing monitoring. They put in place something called environmental land use controls, which meant, which basically said, you can't drink the water. Don't, no, there should be no drinking from any on-site wells. Um, and then uh, there were also groundwater monitoring zones. And that's important because as we go through this case, I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about what the groundwater monitoring zones do, what they don't do, and most importantly, when, when do they end? But this initial decision on the motion to dismiss the, uh, the board was looking at whether or not the violation notices and the compliance commitment agreements meant that the environmental groups uh, could not bring their case and the case needed to be dismissed. And the decision was no. Um, and based on a couple different things, first of all, the easy decision was the fact that we included claims that IEPA did not include. Open dumping was one of those claims. Um, and I will touch on open dumping a little more later, um, but we had open dumping claims and water pollution claims. And we also had um, a range of uh, time period that the IEPA didn't, um, the time periods didn't overlap perfectly. But putting that aside, there were some more important um, rulings by the PCB about even when you do have overlapping claims, can environmental groups still pursue a case before PCB? And the PCB said yes. Um, and they said that the existence of a compliance commitment agreement does not preclude filing by the state or a citizen of an enforcement action. Um, they said, and then Midwest Gen said, well, there has to be some sort of disagreement between the state and the company, the violator, as a precondition to a citizen's complaint. And the PCB said, no, no, there doesn't. Um, and the reason that, and I'm, I'm gonna read the language to you because the reason is important. Um, and the agency said, if there was, or I'm sorry, the PCB said, if you required a disagreement between EPA and the company prior to a citizen's complaint, a citizen could not bring a complaint against violations that the agency had not pursued. So basically, if the agency doesn't act, a citizen wouldn't be able to act if the PCB required a disagreement between the agency and the company. So there could be this whole idea of citizens' case suits being like a gap filling or, you know, acting where the state fails to act. We couldn't bring those if some sort of disagreement was required between the agency and the company. And the PCB that said that sort of result would be absurd. 
So then the question that the PCB looked at is whether or not the cases were duplicative. Um, and the, the PCB said, referring the uh, issuance of violation notices or adoptions of CCAs or a referral to an environmental enforcement authority does not cons constitute a proceeding in another forum. So this idea of like, if you're in state court, can you be before PCB or federal court? That's the type of um, proceeding that's considered duplicative or another forum. The PCB said the agency itself, any sort of proceeding before the agency or enforcement, that is not considered another forum that's duplicative. So that was the motion to dismiss. Um, and I want to be mindful of the time. Then after that, Midwest Gen said, well, you know, we want a motion to stay now because there's a state rulemaking going on. There's a federal coalition rulemaking. And this is something that the board has now looked at at least three or four times, um, once or twice in the Midwest Gen case on the motion to stay, and then at, in the CWLP case on a motion to dismiss, and now again in the CWLP case on a motion for summary judgment. So we're getting this argument over and over again that the state coal ash rulemaking should um, stop these cases. The federal coal ash rulemaking should stop these cases. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, there's even a second motion uh, to stay in the Midwest Gen case on, on the federal coal ash rulemaking right now. So we've just, we, they keep bringing the same motion. And the board says the same thing every time. Um, it, first of all, the board says, rulemakings and enforcement actions are distinct proceedings with different aims. They've said rulemakings are forward-looking and impose future obligations. Enforcement actions are past-looking and, and or they, incur, they involve past or ongoing violations. Um, and the remedies to redress violations that have already happened. Um, so the, the board has said proposed state collash rule does not displace an enforcement action. Um, and they also looked specifically at the Fed, uh, let's see, the state's collash rulemaking. This is back in 2014. And they've looked at that and they said, look, these rulemakings, and they've said this also about the federal collage rulemaking, um, they say these rulemakings do not mandate any specific outcomes at specific sites, but they're intended to be a codification of a process, a general process. And because of that, they are also not duplicative of enforcement proceedings. Finally, the PCB looked at the timing and the duration of the rulemakings and said because their timing is uncertain and their duration is uncertain, um, that's another reason that they should not preclude the enforcement actions. So um, that, those were some of the early on rulings in Midwest Gen. I do want to turn to the Midwest Gen's ruling, the PCB's ruling on liability phase from um, June of 2019. And just, um, I'm going, so a couple of things I want, uh, we mentioned water pollution versus open dumping. Um, it's, you look at 12A and 12D of the Illinois Prote Environmental Protection Act on water pollution. Uh, just quickly on water pollution, it's there's a the act prohibits causing causing threatening or allowing the discharge of contaminants into the environment, so as to tend to cause water pollution, um, either alone in combination with other matter from other sources, or so as to violate regulations and standards adopted by the PCB. So there are lots of different things you can look at. Um, whether, and it can be water pollution, it can, it can be found to be water pollution if it violates 
PCB regulations or standards, which of course include the groundwater protection standards, but also 12D goes on to say, you, there's a prohibition on depositing contaminants upon the land so as to create a water pollution hazard. Uh, I'm not going to read the definitions of contaminants. I think the definition of water pollution I do want to touch on because it's lengthy, detailed, and has lots and lots of different um, elements to it that can be found to be water pollution. Alteration of physical, thermal, chemical, biological, or radioactive properties of water, so basically just altering the water. That's why we have thermal pollution in Illinois or the discharge of a contaminant. Um, that is likely will or is likely to create a nuisance or render waters harmful or detrimental or injurious to public health, safety, or welfare, or domestic, commercial, industrial, agricultural, recreational, or other legitimate uses, or to livestock, wild animals, birds, fish, or other aquatic life. Um, important definition because it is so broad and wraps so much into it. Um, but also, I did mention open dumping. Open dumping was a really important element of our case. Um, and one of the reasons uh, is that the open dumping, um, again, on the motion to dismiss, it distinguished our case from IEP case. Um, and this became very important because of the landfills that we found at, when we entered discovery in the Midwest Gen case, these old landfills. And I'm just going to touch on those for a moment. Um, one, so one reason, and I will touch on this a little more later, but there's a big, becomes a question of what is the source. And this, for those of you who are involved in the federal, any federal coal ash um, enforcement, if you're looking at the federal cases, you will know that that covers ponds. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I get sometimes, I get a little flummoxed there. But what we have seen in the federal cases is that when companies go to do an alternative source demonstration, they are pointing to and saying, look, we can prove that it's not the ponds. What we had in Midwest Gen is an inability to prove in some locations whether contamination was coming from the pond versus the landfill. And our expert even said in the case, look, at certain wells, at certain locations, you can't say, you cannot distinguish. Um, so the, our open dumping claims were important. They wrapped in the landfills, they wrapped in historical dumping that and Ultimately, the board said, when we look at the source, if it's coming from the property, it doesn't matter whether it's the pond or the landfill, the property, the company is still the source. Um, so just wanted to touch on that. Um, yeah, and, and see, then- I was just gonna say that, you, that completely still comes up now. And when you bring up, you know, Midwest Gen, which, you know, and Waukegan, and they always point to the tannery. And it's, I know this is nothing new for the participants that are listening today, but of course, it's an example of an industry saying, well, we're not the ones that created this problem. It was here before us. So why should we be the ones held responsible? So um, yeah, that's, I just, I remember that yeah. argument is heard very many times. Well, and so unfortunately, like I said, beware, because we are still seeing it under the federal coal ash rule, and it is a concern that we are trying, we are raising this with IEPA now in the context of the state coal ash, coal ash rulemaking to try to remedy that problem. A company should not be able to abdicate 
liability for pollution that their property is causing just because it's coming from a landfill on their property instead of the pond. Um, so that's a really important point. In Waukegan, I know I mentioned earlier that in Waukegan, um, I'm going to dive into the Waukegan example a little bit because that's a good one. We had groundwater monitoring wells that were in ash. And at the very outset of the monitoring, one of what the consultants for Midwest Gen said, hey, I'm looking at this well and I'm seeing that there is contamination. We're documenting contamination, but I don't think that's coming from the ponds. I actually think it's because the well, the boring is in ash and it happens to be in an ash, an old ash landfill at the Waukegan site. Well, ultimately, the reason that IEPA did not require them to reline their ponds was that very reason. They said, we, because we're seeing that the, the contamination is coming from a source other than the ponds. Well, yeah, it's coming from the landfill because you had a whole bunch of, you had wells that were in the landfill and then all the other wells were downstream, all, not all of them, but the downstream wells were downstream of the landfill too. So they're catching the contamination from the landfill. So this is one site where IEPA knew the, you know, there's evidence from their own consultants saying the contamination is coming from an on-site landfill and in the compliance commitment agreement, they said, oh, you don't have to reline your ponds because it's not coming from the ponds and don't, they don't do anything about the landfill. Um, so this is an important point. Um, and so I'm gonna turn a little bit, and I may come back to this later, but I'm gonna turn a little bit to groundwater monitoring zones because these became hugely important in this case um, and in the next couple decisions in this case. So um, a, a groundwater monitoring zone is it is established pursuant to the Illinois Administration Code 450 and what it does is say that um, once a GMZ is established, once it's in place, the groundwater underlying the GMZ is not subject to the board's part 620 groundwater standards. So basically it says it relaxes the standard for some period of time while the remedy is ongoing and it's be, it makes sense. It's like, here, you know, here's the reason it makes sense to me. When you're dealing, unlike my back in the air pollution days, once you put a control on a stack, the pollution stopped coming out of the stack. Once you do something like relining a pond, and again, I'm, you know, I'm going to adopt some of the company's arguments just for purposes of discussion, but once you reline a pond, the contamination in the groundwater doesn't stop that second. Um, if you're not doing pump and treat, it takes time. And pump and treat is really reserved for those cases where there's a lot of contamination that could pose a risk to public health. It's in a plume, it's going off the property. It's, you know, it could get into drinking water wells. If people get it, it could be harmful. Like that's when you see pump and treat. When you see something like, uh, let's go with chlorides in groundwater, you know, it's not, you know, not, it's not like arsenic or PCBs or something like that. It's, you know, first of all, generally, now we don't always know because all the monitoring was on site in the Midwest Gen cases and we didn't, we never really got to delineate a plume because we didn't have off site monitoring but the levels of contamination that they were seeing seemed to be confined to the property based on the wells there. And it just was not the type of scenario where the board requires pump and treat. Well, if you're not doing pump and treat, then how does the contamination go away? Natural attenuation. And, you know, just to be clear, um, 
you know, we were clear that we do not support natural attenuation. If you just say, okay, we're going to allow natural attenuation, we're going to put a GMZ on, that's the remedy. No, not, not okay, not enough. Natural attenuation with source control and then a GMZ. Okay, that's a different, as long as there is source control that stops the source, then you can have natural attenuation with monitoring to determine that it does in fact attenuate over time. And then in that time period, you have a GMZ. Otherwise, the company could get slapped with violations of the regs during the whole time after the source control has been put in place. Was this the Midwest Gen case? No, because we didn't have complete source control. We only had source control on some of the ponds. The agency hadn't done anything about the landfills, but they put a GMZ in place and the GMZ covered the wells where there were documented violations, of all the existing wells. So then we're there at the board, we're enforcing, we're enforcing the part 620 groundwater monitoring standards. We've got, again, we have the act 12A, 12D, um, which are the water pollution provisions and 21A, which is the open dumping. And some other um, 620 regulations as well. So, you know, that's what we're enforcing over and the board gets this decision and is trying to determine, okay, when do the violations, when do the violations of part 620, where do those kick in? Well, then the question becomes, when does the GMZ end? Um, and let me, I've got some quotes here from it. So the GMZ, I'm gonna scroll down and try to find my, oh, here's my better quote. Um, so a GMZ, and this is on, this comes from the motion for, re, the board's order on the motion for reconsideration. A GMZ expires when the agency receives appropriate documentation confirming two conditions as described in section 620.250C. The documentation must confirm that the corrective action taken under the regulations is complete Second, the documentation must confirm that the applicable groundwater quality standards have been attained. So that is very important. And then the question is, well, what are you talking about? What are the applicable groundwater quality standards? Well, there are two different pathways. Either they have actually attained the part 20 standards, the groundwater standards, natural attenuation has completely worked, the levels have all come down, standards have been attained. Did that happen in Midwest Gen? No, and again, the reason I will point out to you is that there wasn't source control of all the sources. They were not gonna be able to attain groundwater quality standards. Well, in, if that's the case, then what standards apply? Well, the board and the, not the board, the agency and the company usually get together and say, okay, well, we need standards that we can attain with, with attenuation, um, but we may not be able to get, you know, may not be able to get it all the way down to part 620 standards. I mean, background, I'm not going to get into background because that gets super technical, but in a lot of places, background is higher than part 620 standards, you know, or so for all those reasons, then the company and the agency work together to standards that are still sufficiently protective of and so on and so forth. So then the question is, did they do that in Midwest Gen? No, they never did. So in the initial decision, um, when the board was looking at the question of, did the GMZs end? And if they ended, it meant that we had a lot more violations of the groundwater protection standards the second the GMCs ended. So the board in the first Midwest Gen decision said, a GMZ is established for a period of time necessary to mitigate the impairment caused by the release of the contaminants. 
And the owner and operator must undertake adequate corrective action in a timely and ap appropriate manner. Um, I saw a question pop up and, and I just want to pause if, oh, okay, that looks like it's all Yeah, no, it's all right. I'll take care of it. Okay, no, um, bear with me here. I want to close the chat or at least move it over. Um, so, okay, so alternative standards were never set pursuant to subpart D. So the board looked at, well, what has Midwest Gen done? Midwest Gen provided a statement to the agency saying they completed the measures in the CCA. Again, this was relining the ponds, um, setting up, they had the groundwater monitoring in place. Um, in certain places, they were restricted from putting any coal ash on the ground. So they did, they relined the ponds and that was completed. The board also spent a lot of time looking at timely and appropriate um, remedies, but they said, well, monitoring, monitoring combined with natural attenuation cannot be part of the remedy um, that we're waiting for completion of because monitoring, who knows how long that's going to go on for. And monitoring is not really a remedy. Like monitoring isn't doing anything to fix the groundwater. It's monitoring the groundwater. So then Midwest Gen also, I'm sorry, the board also looked at the, e, the environmental land use controls. Those are gonna stay in place. But Midwest, but the board said, that's also not part of the corrective action. That's just saying people shouldn't use the groundwater. And that stays on again, sort of indefinitely like the monitoring um, so that's not really part of the corrective action. So then um, basically the board said, okay, well, the remedy is the stuff in the CCAs. It's the relining of the ponds. When Midwest Gen submitted a statement that that was complete, then the corrective action was complete. And that's it. The, the GMZs are no longer in place. Um, so they're not in place while natural attenuation is going on. They're not in place while this monitoring is going on. And basically, this caused massive upheaval in the environmental community, in the company, the regulated community, over the fact that basically the board said they can no longer use source control plus natural attenuation and monitoring as a package of a remedy the, the corrective action is just the source control, natural attenuation and monitoring is no longer part of the remedy and companies basically were given no time to allow the natural attenuation to work. They were gonna start getting slammed with violations the second the source control was complete. In this case, it was the relining of the ponds. So um, Midwest Gen files a motion for reconsideration and we get this amicus brief from the whole regulated community saying that this is like turning environmental law on its head in Illinois. Um, so the, so I read you the quote before, but again, I wanna turn back to this idea of appropriate documentation confirming two conditions. Corrective action is complete and applicable groundwater quality standards have been attained. When the board re-examined its decision, it said, yeah, we, we realize Midwest Gen has not submitted to the agency confirmation that both conditions have been met. Um, so basically they look at the process of ending a GMZ the, the board is like, eh, we're going to decide that's a more formal process where there's this, instead of just saying the compliance commitment agreement, which is only one part really of it, instead of looking that as this, the documentation that the remedy is complete and the standards have been attained, there's a more formal process here of Midwest Gen working with the agency to say it's complete and um, that you know the standards, applicable standards have been attained and the corrective action is complete. 
Um, and the board even looked back at one, one window there, um, Powerton, at Powerton, the pond relining was completed within two weeks of the compliance commitment agreement being put in place. And then that's when Midwest Gen submitted their documentation that the compliance commitment agreement was complete. Um, and that was what the board had looked at. And they said, we realize that two weeks is kind of short um, and we realize why our decision was wrong. So the board reversed, um, which again, from sort of any litigator's perspective, it's like a court changing its mind on its decision. It doesn't happen very often. Um, we were surprised, but I have to say, um, I don't view this as a bad outcome in the case because I, I would have been concerned about the board's first decision going up on appeal to the state courts. I think there would have been risk there. That risk is now gone. Um, we have a much, you know, with the board's reconsideration, we have a much more, uh, you know, a reliable decision. Um, so I would have been concerned on appeal. Uh, so not, not a bad outcome from a litigation and appeal perspective. Um, but I, I wanna turn back to a couple of points that were also really important here. Again, groundwater monitoring zone only provides, uh, it, it only lifts the application of part 620 regulations, which are the groundwater protection standards. Another thing the board noted in its motion in the decision on reconsideration is that that GMZ does not apply to violations of 12A, 12D, and 21A. It does not apply to violations of the act. So on that motion for reconsideration, we got a really important clarification of the law from the board that all the during that whole period that the GMZ is in place, there are still violations of the act. So we have we have violations of the regs when the GMZ is not in place and at Waukegan because there was no GMZ there because there was no relining of the ponds. So we have violations of everything at Waukegan and violations of the act at all the other locations, which are Powhatan, Joliet, um, and Will County, when even when the GMZ is in place. Um, so that's why the distinction between violations of the act and the regs are really important for purposes of a groundwater monitoring zone. Um, I know I'm getting close to question and answer time, so I'm gonna turn to Sierra Club versus CWLP. Um, and I think I've heard the most important points here, which is really, again, rulemakings versus enforcement actions. The board looked at that question again and said, they're different, they're on different timelines, there's uncertainty, but most of all, um, these are not, you know, they're, they're, they're different proceedings. Enforcement is backwards looking, rulemaking is forwards looking, one does not displace the other. Um, CCAs came up again and the, the board turned back to the Midwest Generation decision and said, look, we're allowing citizen enforcement actions to proceed um, where the agency fails to act, but also, what, you know, even if there is a disagreement between the agency and the company, um, that is not a prerequisite to citizen enforcement actions. And they re referred back to Midwest Generation, but also Freeman United Coal Company very important decision that I want to mention. Um, Jessica Dexter of ELPC worked on that one, and that was a great decision, great precedent, both for Midwest Gen and for the CWLP case. Um, I do want to spend a couple of minutes on off-site versus on-site violations, because this is an important piece of law that came out of um, the CWLP case. And we've heard this again from the companies over and over again, which is if their violation, if the violation is just under the property, 
then you can't bring an enforcement action. And there are, so the, the way monitoring, and this is what I heard from Illinois EPA many years ago when we went in to talk to the agency about all of the violations of groundwater regulations, groundwater protection standards that we were seeing at all of these different sites. And the agency said, oh, this is how the regs are intended to work. First, you set up just a couple of monitors, maybe at the edge of the unit, blah, 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 and you document violations. If you find violations, then the second thing you do is set up a much broader set of monitoring where you delineate the scope of the plume. And the, the fact that we were like, okay, that's great. That's really helpful, helps us to understand the way the regs work and what the agency was doing with monitoring. But did the agency ever do that with all of this monitoring of coal ash ponds in Illinois? No, they never went back to any of these sources where there were documented violations to delineate the plume. But what the companies have done with this is make the argument that, oh, well then there are no at there are no violations of the groundwater protection standards if the violation is just under the property. And the board said no. And they refer, we're looking at sections 320, I'm sorry, 620301A. Um, and it, that one says, no person shall cause, threaten, or allow the release of a contaminant to a resource groundwater such that additional treatment is necessary or an existing or potential use of such groundwater is precluded. Um, and the board said that doesn't require off-site groundwater contamination. Um, so on-site violations are enough. Uh, so that was a really important clarification of the law from the board on that one. Um, CWLP in January of 2020, we finished briefing summary judgment motions and we heard a big argument again that the state coal ash rulemaking should just get rid of this whole case, um, waiting for a decision on that one. And just um, one or two minutes on state, the state coal ash rule compared to the federal CCR rule. Um, number one, I'm sure all of you know that the federal CCR rule is um, just getting chipped away at by the Trump administration. There are hearings going on on that right now. If you want to participate, um, definitely reach out. Uh, we, and I can even have, I don't know, Colleen, if you guys have received any of the sign up information or the talking points but I have that, I could share it. Um, Andrew yeah. Rain, yeah. I can, I can put some in the chat, I think, or we'll send it around uh, mm -hmm. in an email after this. Okay, I can make sure you get it, but um, Jenny Castle at Earth Justice, Andrew Rain, or, uh, or Jenny, I don't think Andrew Rain actually is working on that, but Jenny Castle at Earth Justice is a good person to reach out to on that. Um, so one or two minutes on comparing the state collage rule to the federal CCR rule. One of the really important things about the state collage rule is the involvement of IEPA and the oversight, the, a lot of the agency oversight there, whereas the federal collage rule requires citizen enforcement. And it's this sort of, um, there are it, it triggers action by the company, one um, piece of action after another. For instance, you start with detection monitoring. If you see violations there, you go to assessment monitoring. Maybe you do an alternative source demonstration. It's one action triggers the next. Whereas the state collage rule, it's not gonna have this tier three, tier four, I'm sorry, appendix three, appendix four structure of detection monitoring versus assessment monitoring. It violations of state groundwater protection standards will still be violations. So that's really important, um, more, much more protective, and the very same standards we were enforcing in these cases. Um, this state collage rulemaking has more worker protections when there's, uh, during removal or remedy, um, it has, it ha considers 
environmental justice uh, areas and has a, a way that environmental justice areas are more protective. Um, so, and that rulemaking is just starting right now, the state collage rulemaking. Um, so another opportunity to participate. Uh, we will have lots of materials for people if you want to comment, if you want to participate in a hearing. Um, so now I want to wrap it up so that we have time for questions. Faith, that was awesome. Um, in case people on this webinar haven't met Faith before, she um, is a rock star and has been fighting this good fight for so long. Um, and there's a lot of other people who I know are dialed in, whether it's um, people like Joyce Blumenshine, who's been fighting this on the grassroots level, or Jenny Castle, who's on, uh, Kiana and David from ELPC. IUC has jumped in kind of not in the decades of, of all of this doing the legal work, but we're um, happy to work with our partners here um, to pass legislation last year uh, that led to the state collapse rulemaking. Um, I have a lot of questions I think would be good follow-ups, but I see um, that Joyce asked, with the rollback of the federal collapse rules happening and all the uncertainty around those, and then the fact that the state rulemaking is just now getting started, what's happening to the ponds that are scheduled to close this year? Um, or those that are kind of currently in limbo, you know, whether that's Vermilion or Hennepin, etc. So I hope you can still hear me. Zoom started going a little sideways there. Um, but so, from what I understand, and again, there are lots of folks on the line who, you know, can also answer this question. Um, I, the, the closures that I have heard about, I haven't heard of any of those um, shifting their timelines, with the exception of Lincoln Stone Quarry, which was proceeding under a different, it, it, it had its own proceeding, uh, uh, application to close before PCB, that's one I know that has shifted, but more as a result of the state coal ash rulemaking, as opposed to uncertainty at the federal level. Um, so I think, yes, uh, there's obviously uncertainty at the federal level. I know the companies don't like uncertainty either. Um, so I'm not sure that that will lead to a huge um, influx of cases of delays uh, it, because it is, you know, those rules are in process of getting rolled back. There's not, um, there, that's still an ongoing thing. So state collage working you know, is going to be. Hey Faith, do you oh. mind if I jump in to yeah, 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 yeah. try to answer that question real quick? Sure. Thank you. Hey guys, this is Jenny. Um, so yeah, this is definitely something that we've taken a close look at, Joyce and others, because it is clearly of a concern. We want to make sure that this rulemaking process that we've fought so hard for makes a humongous difference, right, in terms of how these plants are required to close. Um, so in taking a good look at this, we strongly believe that the federal requirements basically say you are not, like, part of the closure requirements is you have to get a state permit um, or you're not required to close until you can get whatever state permit you may need to get to close. Well, guess what? Under the law we passed last year, they have to get a state permit, right? And so because of that, we think that for all of the plants that have not yet submitted closure um, or didn't submit closure applications, um, until after May 1st of last year, which is where the sort of cutoff point is in the Illinois rule, in the Illinois law, excuse me, um, they won't be able to close until they get a permit under these rules. And so we won't even start seeing those permits, of course, until well after the rulemaking has been finalized because they need to know what they have to do to get a permit before they can apply for one. Um, so I think there are some, right, that have already applied to close, that applied to close before the May 1st, 2019 deadline in SB9. Um, and then the other sort of part of that is, not only do they have to apply to close, and I apologize for the piano practice happening behind me, <laughs> um, not only do they have to apply to close, 
before May 1st, 2019, they also have to complete closure within two years of that. So if they don't meet both of those requirements, they have to get a totally new Illinois permit under these rules. Um, if they had closed before that under Illinois rules, that's a slightly different matter. And I think we'll be working through that in the rulemaking, but for a good number of impoundments that are at issue um, right now that haven't yet closed, our rules matter, right? And this rulemaking really will make a difference and get bypassed by the federal requirements. Thanks, Jenny, um, for all that you do and for helping answer that. So we have time probably for one or two other questions. Joyce asked a question that I actually kind of want to expand. Um, when we talk about, and for people who aren't as knowledgeable about coal ash, um, you know, Illinois has more than any other state uh, a problem with this with over 80 dump sites. Um, and what happens to this coal ash, right? When we talk about closure, um, pump and treat, whatever that may be, Joyce, uh, is asking a question about beneficial use, which I don't think we've touched on yet. Um, but like, maybe you guys could answer what are the different ways in which, what is the end result of all of this coal ash? If it is beneficial use, what does that actually mean? And then uh, to Joyce's point, what happens when it's just dumped in old mine impoundments? Oh, well, there's a lot, there's a lot to touch on there. So, um, Generally, the options when you're closing a pond or a landfill, the options are either closure in place or removal. Um, one of the things that we are, that we, first of all, the federal rule um, has a performance standard and the performance standard um, does not allow closure in place if, if ash is in contact with the groundwater. That is something we have asked at the state level for the state rulemaking. We've asked for that to be clarified um, because that's a really important standard. We don't want coal ash either in landfills or in ponds sitting in the groundwater where it can leach. So number one, we're arguing you can only close in place where the ash is not in contact with the groundwater. And then what you would do is cap it. It would need to be an impermeal cap, um, lots of requirements there, lots of considerations and standards to be met, but an impermeable cap that doesn't allow rainwater to filter through that would also cause leaching to the groundwater. Um, obviously, I would, I just, th this is a hot topic and, and a and sensitive topic because removal, yes, there are concerns around removal. The companies are really good about raising those concerns and making, raising big, you know, making a big to-do about number of truck trips and blah, blah, blah. And obviously those are concerns. But for removal, again, at the, in the state level rulemaking, we have argued that uh, there are a lot of considerations that need to be made, including removing by rail or by bar instead of just by um, looking for the closest landfill that is that meets all the requirements, as in it needs to be properly lined and have a leachate collection system and meet all the very the most rigorous requirements, or the option of even constructing an on-site landfill with a proper liner and a you know, leachate collection system, again meeting all the rigorous requirements for landfills. Uh, so th those are the options. Um, obviously, then there is CCR with beneficial reuse. There are state regulations on that. Um, again, it needs to be go through adequate testing. Uh, we are not, you know, we, I, I'm going to turn to the Midwest Gen example again, just because this did come up. Uh, there was a lot of construction around the Midwest Gen sites with the CCR um that and midwest gen of course made the argument that that was beneficially reused reused but if it didn't meet all the state requirements which are lengthy for beneficial reuse including testing it before you use it to make sure that it's not going to leach contaminants 
if it doesn't meet all those requirements, then it's not considered beneficial reuse. And it does, we argued all of that was just open dumping. Yeah, I know I asked a big question, but that was great. And we probably could spend a whole day of CLE credits talking about this issue. Um, but we are just a couple minutes after one o'clock. Um, for people who didn't get their answers, uh, excuse me, questions answered, or were calling in on the phone, um, just shoot me an email at colleen at ilenviro.org uh, or IEC at ilenviro.org. Um, that also applies to if you wanted CLE credits and you didn't sign up through the link. Um, again, thank you guys for joining, for supporting IEC. Um, there's some information that Tucker just dropped into the chat box about how you can continue to support us by becoming a member. Um, and thank you again to Faith and everyone for joining today. Have a good Thank rest of your day. So Join us tomorrow. Thanks, Thanks Jen. <laughs> Thanks, Jen.